The opening chapters of Genesis are as controversial as any part of the Bible. It's impossible to approach them these days without questions. But the important thing about Genesis is not the questions that we want to ask it, but rather the questions that it asks us. In life I've often found that my questions are actually the wrong ones to ask. They fail to help me find the truth, in fact, they rather get in the way of the data that is presented to me. They are programming me often to misunderstand what I'm looking at. For the great trick of research is not finding the answers. The great trick of research is finding the right questions. If you find the right questions, the answers will tumble out. But as long as you've got the wrong questions in your mind, you don't know what, to, what sense to make of the data that you're given. It's like looking for phone numbers in a road directory, or looking for road directions in a phone nut book. You can gain some information, but most of the information you gain you can't make sense of, because it doesn't address the issues that are in your mind. But there's loads of very valuable information that's available to you. Now Genesis asks us big questions. Big questions about life and about God, about death and about being a person, about meanings and meaninglessness, about sex and relationships. The big questions of who am I and what am I? Genesis 1 to 11 is addressing huge questions. What should I do? How should I live? And en route, we will cover many big issues. The issues of today, like abortion and euthanasia and ecology. Genesis 1 to 11 is the area in which the Bible is addressing these issues and many more. But more importantly than these issues, Genesis provides us the framework and questions that the New Testament comes to answer. That is, Genesis 1 to 11 is not about ecology. Uh, the author is not particularly interested in the, the modern problems of global warming. It may have implications for global warming, but it is implications for it, inferences we may draw from it, but it's not about that. It really is creating the framework for you to understand God's plan in Jesus. And so in each of the studies we're going through today, we will, be, uh, we will be jumping across, in each of these studies in Genesis 1 to 11, we'll be jumping across into the New Testament to see the way of Jesus. But now let's turn to Genesis 1 and make some observations about it. Firstly, the obvious observations to make are the structure and movement of Genesis 1. For it's one of the great pieces of literature. Once read, never forgotten. It proceeds with an orderly, majestic kind of pattern as it unfolds creation before us, each stage spelling out more of the universe created by God, moving from the totality to the details, but with its climax in the creation of humanity and the conclusion in the day of rest. The structure is created by the repetitive chorus, and God said, let there be, fill in the blank, and it was so, God saw, and it was good, God called, and there was evening, and there was morning, the day. And this structure gives to the chapter its memorability its ease of understanding, its, its sense of movement, its message, 
that the world is an orderly place created in an orderly fashion by its author and creator. That is, Genesis 1 teaches us and gives to us an orderly account of an orderly creation. The form fits the function of Genesis 1. The message matches the medium. Even in the structure, the message of the chapter is contained. And God said, we see the creation by his word. Let there be, and it was so, and we see the creation was obedient to his word. God saw, and it was good, and we see creation satisfying God's intention. God called, and we see creation under his lordship. And there was evening, and there was morning, the day, and we see creation by orderly progression. The very form of Genesis 1 teaches the content of Genesis 1, which is what makes it such a powerful piece of just literature. It's brilliant. Within this message, certain themes leap out at us. Here are the five main and very obvious themes. Firstly, there is God. The very word occurs 35 times in 34 verses, and almost always as the subject of the verb, the subject of the sentence. That is, God is the dominant actor in the creation of the whole universe. You can say it's about creation, but it's really about God creating. The one God created everything. He has no rival. God is not part of creation. He is before it in the beginning. He is outside of it. He is over it, the Lord and ruler of it all. It is his work. It is his creation. And God is personal in the sense that he speaks. He creates. He intends to do what he does. He sees that it is good. God is not an impersonal force. God is the personal creator. That is how we are introduced to God at the very beginning of the Bible. If you want to know who, what God is, he is the personal creator. Secondly, we're told about creation. First about God, secondly about creation. We see creation in terms of its extent. Everything is created. In terms of its source, it all comes from God. In terms of its quality, it is all good. It was good, it was good, it was good, it was very good. In terms of its character, it is purposeful and orderly. In terms of its position, it is all under God and, by the end of the chapter, it's all under humanity as well. The material world is not evil or bad. Maya, as the Hare Krishna would call it, some delusion to take you away from your true spiritual understanding. It's not like that. The material world is good. The material world does not exist eternally as the materialists would believe, always ever being here. It has a beginning. The material world is not an accident, as the atheists would say that the Big Bang happened for no rhyme, no reason, and here we are. The material world in Genesis 1 is all created intentionally by God and fulfills his purposes. Thirdly, we're told that the creation was by the word. Notice throughout the chapter, the way God created is by his word. And God said... Let there be, and there was. The details of the mechanism used are of no interest to the author. In a technological, scientific community like ourselves, this is enormously frustrating because the thing that we are most interested in is the mechanics, is the details. They're of no interest to this author. For his point is the power of God and the meaningfulness of creation the power of God, for like the mighty God that he is, he only has to speak and it happens. Really powerful people do not act, they speak. 
and as a result of their commands, all kinds of other people go out and do the work that is necessary. And then afterwards they come along and they put a little plaque saying this bridge was built by the mayor of, but of course the mayor of never did anything other than say the word that the bridge was to be built. Power resides in those who can speak and as a result of their speech, things happen. As a result of God's speech, the universe was created. Did he use a big bang? Well, there's no reason why he couldn't use a big bang if he wanted to use a big bang, but it's not discussed. There's no evidence here that he did or that he didn't use a bang. If that is the truth, that is the truth. If it's not the truth, don't worry about it, he didn't use it. Nowhere does Genesis 1 tell us about the mechanism because it's not interested in the mechanism but in the power of God who speaks and it was so. But that also, this creation by the word, means the creation is meaningful. For like the personal God that he is, he spoke rationally and creation came into existence. He is not an impersonal force and the creation was not a mistake. The creation is not an extension of him. You may never have thought of that as a possibility, but of course other cultures in other groups of people have indeed thought like that. That there is the one force being and out of this force being emanated all kinds of things, the last of which is the physical world in which we exist. The Bible says God spoke into existence what he wanted. And so he intentionally communicated his plans and his plans came into operation in this world. The fourth theme in Genesis 1 is us, is humans. The significance of the humans in the creation is brought out by the climax marked by the change in wording at verse 26. Look there with me. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Suddenly, God consults on creation. We're not told with whom he consults or whether it's just a kind of royal plural, let us, but it is not let there be, suddenly there is let us make. Humans are just like the rest of creation in that we are made. We are created. We are manufactured. But humans are not like the rest of creation in that we are made in God's image and after his likeness. This and only this part of the created order is godlike. Godlike in its dominion, its rule over all creation, but yet it is still under God himself. Here is the significance of humans. We are created to rule the world under God. Now this is a huge subject and very important for us humans. And so the next study, we're going to be seeing the promise of humanity. It's a very important study in the big issues of bioethics, euthanasia, embryonic stem cell research, ecology, abortion, capital punishment, suicide, as well as personal issues as to who am I and what am I, all come into view when we look at this passage. But clearly, as you read Genesis 1, the creation of humanity is distinctive. The pattern is broken. And now more is said about humans than any other part of creation. But let's go looking at the fifth theme, that of rest. For the account of creation doesn't finish with the creation of man. It goes on into the seventh day, the day of rest. 
It's the conclusion, it's the, the outcome, it's the kind of resolution, the denouement of all that leads up to it. That is God's rest. Creation is not a continuous state. God is not forever creating new. God has made the world, but he's made the world to rest with him. For he rested from his work and declared that day to be holy and special. The day of rest is what we call eternal life. There is no eighth day of creation. The seventh day is the day that is now where God is. It says that there is more to reality than just work, than just this creation. It speaks of God continuing to exist outside of his role of creating, as well as outside of his creation. It speaks of a final time, God's time, beyond this world and its order. It speaks of being with God in his holy day, resting from labour. Now, here are just five themes, obvious themes that run through the chapter. There are many more themes that we could pick up. But here in the opening chapter of the Bible, notice how it lies as the background to Jesus. For in the opening chapter of the Gospel of John, we're reminded of Genesis 1. Turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. For it starts in much the same terms as Genesis 1, with its reference to the beginning. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. God was in the beginning. That is, God the creator was in the beginning, creating all things. Here in John chapter 1, the emphasis is not on God, but upon his word who was with him in the beginning, creating everything. But of course, in Genesis 1, he does create everything by his word. Still, God is the creator of all things. The God of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, is the personal creator of everything by his word. But secondly, there is creation in Genesis 1. For all things other than God were made, were created by God. There is nothing bad or wrong about the things that were created. There is nothing outside of creation other than God. But that brings us to the third important topic of the passage in John 1. For there was something that was before creation. There was something that was in the beginning with God, that was not created like everything else. There was the Word of God. The Word of God was not part of creation. The Word of God was how God created. So when we say God existed before creation and outside of creation, the God who existed was the God who speaks. His Word existed before creation and outside of creation. And there, this word is the word by which everything that was made was created. For God created all things by his word. He spoke and they came into being. In fact, nothing was created except by God's word. Look at verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And God's word was not part of creation. His word was not independent of him. So in the division between the creator and the created, the word of God is on the side of the creator, not the created. And God and his word cannot be separated. For the word was in the beginning and the word, verse 1, was God. Because I tell lies, because I'm a liar, it may be possible to separate me from my word. 
But if I only ever told you the truth all the time, then what my words sa said, I said. And what I say is what my word says. If you knew my word, you would know me, and if you knew me, you would know my word. It would be impossible to separate me from my word if I was a truth teller, as God is. The word is not something that God has created, but is the expression of God himself. The Jehovah's Witnesses, who come knocking on our doors, never understand this passage. The problem is not with verse 1, it really is with verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. They want to say that the Word was the very first thing created by God. A, a second God, so to speak, a demiurge. But a creature made by God. So there is God the Father, and he then made the Word. And then the Word made creation. But verse 3 says that everything was created through the Word. Everything that was created was created through the Word. And so the second God who was created also had to be created through the Word, which was difficult seeing he wasn't there to create himself. It doesn't actually work. If everything that was created and nothing, notice the negative, nothing's outside of what the Word created, then the Word did not create himself. And so the Word was not a creature. What we have in verses 1 to 3 appears actually to be a standard piece of Old Testament teaching, personifying the Word of God. Psalm 33 verse 6 tells us, by the breath of God, by the Word of God, were the heavens created and all the earth created. And indeed, you can translate the word he as it in Greek at this point in time, in this particular passage. And so John 1 could read, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, it was in the beginning with God, all things were made through it, and without it was not anything made that was made. And if you wrote that, not a Jewish person would raise an eyebrow, because it would be thoroughly orthodox, expected, Jewish understanding of Genesis 1. But then look down to verse 14. For there we see it's not just a personification of the word, for the word of God becomes human. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is not then a literary device of personification. This is the claiming that the Word of God, who was with God and was God, through whom God made the world, that the Word of God became human, fully human, became flesh, that he became so human that we have seen him and that we know him and know him to be the Son of God, just like his father, with his father's signature characteristics of grace and truth. And why? Why did the word become flesh, become human? But to bring us to rest, the fifth of the themes of Genesis 1. Now, the word rest is not used here in John 1, but the concept of grace is the concept of rest. For this word become flesh has given to us grace upon grace, verse 16. The merciful, forgiving state of being in the kindness of God. The character of God has come upon us in Jesus. From Moses we received the law, which taught us of God's grace, but also condemned us because of our failures to keep it. But from the Word who became flesh, from the Son of God, God the Father, we have received from, not from our labours, but from his labours, rest. We have received the grace and mercy of forgiveness. We have come to know God as our Father. Well, 
as we start our series in Genesis here, we start with questions. But the important questions are not our questions of Genesis, but Genesis questions of us. For in a simple, straightforward description of creation, Genesis gives the answers to the big questions of who do we think we are? What am I? What is the world about? Why is it the way that it is? Who, if anybody, is in control of the world? What is the purpose of life, if there is a purpose? It's in Jesus that we see these answers to Genesis coming to their real conclusion. For Jesus is the man created in God's image, through whom and by whom and for whom the world was created. And Jesus is the one who comes to bring us into God's eternal rest. That is, Genesis 1 sets for us the foundations of all our discussions and understanding of life. If God wasn't the creator, intentionally, by his word, a personal creator, then the whole issue of the gospel, of our rebellion against God, of his son coming to die for us, would all be the wrong answers and the wrong questions. It would actually not make sense. If, if the world is but an illusion meant to deceive us from our true spiritual state, then God becoming a human is a ridiculous notion. That, that is a completely different concept that we are dealing with. Our culture has been deeply indebted to Christianity and to Judaism before it, so that we think these concepts are fairly normal concepts. But they are not normal concepts if you go into other cultures at other times. They are radically different from Hinduism, completely different from Buddhism. They are completely different from the Baal worships of the ancient Canaanites and the like. They are a different philosophical system to the Greek system of Plato or of Socrates. It's a different way of thinking about the world and Genesis 1 lays out a philosophy of life which is built upon God creating all and in particular humans for a time of rest with him. 